I'd like to take a point of personal preference, as, as one of our predecessors was like to say, but I would wholeheartedly like to welcome Dr. Akil Ross to his new role. Um, I, I found it a little bit dismaying that there was very little recognition on the district website and, and next to no f um, fanfare in the community and in the media about this, but he has all the bona fides and is a man willing to get out of his comfort zone to help the community in which he lives and in which he loves. Okay, more than those things, I know that Dr. Ross will bring us together to a place where everyone has, has a place at the district table. He will remove barriers and promote mutual respect through defining common goals, job enrichment, willingness to receive good and bad news honestly reported, uh, rewarding risk takers even in failure, and relishing success. He will do all of this and, and for, the same, for the only reason that we're here, and that's to focus on student outcomes. Welcome, Dr. Ross. Thank you so much. It is an honor to be here. It's um, our privilege to stand in this position. Uh, I know the uh, awesome power uh, that this represents, and I hope to, to make our community proud. Uh, this is not about me, it's about we. And so that's what we're going to move forward with tonight. Uh, in that uh, span of, of, of we, uh, I want to talk about uh, who we are. We are District 5. And um, I want to use the work that we're currently doing with the district strategic plan. Uh, as state regulation states, we are to do this every five years. And uh, this gives us a great opportunity to define who we are as a district. Uh, I want to thank uh, Director Holden, who, who briefed me on this on my uh, second day on the job, and uh, the 70-odd 70, the 70 staff members who are working with him to uh, bring this to fruition. But according to State Regulation 43-261, we are to have these strategic plans and that they are to include school climate, there to include student achievement and teacher administrator quality. Uh, when I teach my students, and I teach students who are becoming principals uh, and school leaders, I let them know that school climate first begins with culture. What, if I bring anything to the table, is that I have traveled across the, the country and halfway around the world uh, talking about culture in School District 5. Culture is who we are. It's our beliefs, it's our values, it's the valued practices that we have. It's the things that we, we hold dear to ourselves. And I believe that the strategic plan gives us this opportunity to redefine our culture, who we are, and what we value. Uh, in showcasing this, I think it's time that we define our culture before someone defines it for themselves. And so with that, uh, it's a time to create what I believe is shared vision and a mission. Uh, right now, uh, as um, we look at board policy, there's a disconnect between the board vision and the district vision. This is a great opportunity to align those, to find that vision together. And I believe it starts with our students, their needs, and when we can identify the students' needs, then the community will adhere to those. And when the community adheres to those needs, then the Board of Trustees will represent the community's wishes for those students. They will direct uh, through, the through the superintendent, the administration, to take care of those student needs and provide for the needs of our faculty and staff, who will then provide for the needs of our students. This is the way in which a community works. This is a way in which a system should work. And if we align our visions, uh, I had the opportunity to visit with uh, our school leaders, and I asked them, what is your vision for our district? It is not about what vision I bring, but your vision. From your perspective, from Seven Oaks to Piney Woods, what is your vision for our district as, as one? If we can gather that, uh, then we're on a way of defining who we are. And so, 
When I teach our students, I teach a, a very uh, specific system. It's the alignment of vision, mission, and outcomes. And when these are in line, the outcomes, when mission and vision are aligned, the outcomes speak for themselves. And we call that the feedback loop. That lets us know when a child says, this is, this is the experience that we want. When a family says, this is the experience that you should have your child in, that refuels our, our system. It reignites our vision, and we continue the system over and over again. We are coming from very diverse experiences, very diverse backgrounds, but if we work together, we can become a system. By definition, that's what it is. We don't all have to be the same, but we all have to work together. So to that end, uh, what is the vision? It's what we see of the future. What is that image? And so I've asked our school leaders, I've talked to Teacher Forum, uh, I will continue to engage with uh, ask and set one-on-one uh, -on -one with each member here and ask what their vision is. This vision gathering that we're doing, we include you as a community. How do you see our district moving forward? So after we align the vision, after we have an idea of the road that we want to take, the next question is how? How do we get there? That's the mission. If we have a vision of being a system, we must work as one. The board member of Code of Ethics and the uh, policy BDD, board uh, superintendent relationship, spells this out very clearly. The board has one employee, that's the superintendent. The superintendent uh, works through the district and the schools to get that done. How does that relationship look? Now, um, I learned in the third grade and uh, I spent two years in the third grade, so I think I got it, that every book report has the who, what, when, where, why, and how. And we use that method to teach how this relationship works. Who and how will do the job? That's up to the schools and the administration. What, when, and where? That's by law and by policy, the role of the school board. But the why, that's for us. That's for us to understand in every child, for every family. The why is what I need your help with because it exists in your homes, at your kitchen tables, in the car rider lines when you pick your child up, in the cafeteria when you're wondering who they're sitting with. The why is what we need your help with. And that's constantly changing our why. And our children need us to answer that question in order for us to work as a system. And so the last part, is once we have our vision, once we have our mission set, then we move to outcomes. Are we measuring the right things? As a high school principal, former high school principal, I was very excited about graduation rates. But then I realized that students coming back with diplomas who couldn't leverage that for the careers that they wanted. They were looking for um, low debt or no debt post-secondary options. They were looking for opportunities to have a better life than their parents. It wasn't just about graduation rates. It's about the preparation rate. How many of our students are prepared once they receive a diploma to enter into the field of work prepared to compete on a global level? What outcomes do we seek? If our vision is aligned and our mission is aligned, then our outcomes will be aligned as well. I believe that our outcomes should maximize the potential of every child, mind, body, and spirit. And to that end, I ask uh, the board to permit me to tell a small story and it's about uh, of the 42 tribes in uh, Kenya, one of the most famous are the Maasai. The Maasai warriors have a greeting when they see each other. Kasinya Ngera, Kasinya Ngera, which means, and how are the children? These brave lion hunters, when they see another warrior, 
They ask the question, and how are the children? Whether they have children or not, that's their main concern. And they want to hear only one response. And that response should be sapati engera, which means all the children are well. If they hear any other response, they immediately prepare for war. Because the Messiah know that if the children are not well, then the community is not well. I ask that at these meetings and meetings that we host, we include a part where we ask like the Messiah warrior, and how are the children? As I talk to parent groups and teacher groups and as I talk to our school leaders and our board, we know of a lot of children who are doing very well. They're enjoying their summer right now. But we're also hearing about students who are not doing well. We're also hearing about students who are suffering from anxiety and depression. We're also hearing about students who are suffering from uh, substance use disorder. We're hearing about students who, with low self-esteem, students who are scared about coming to school. Until all the children are well, we must continue to answer, ask and answer that question. And so I would ask our community that as we engage in dialogue, is that question being engaged? I talked with a teacher at Dutch Fork High School who said, Dr. Ross, this year, when my students return face to face, there's usually a rise and fall in the emotions of the children. But this year, it was neutral. I could not get a laugh or a tear from them. They were neutral. When she went to ask this child, you know, why are you, what's, what's going on? This is, not, this is not normal. The child said, all the adults are fighting. That child is looking to us for an example. How are the children? Should be our mantra. Should be what brings us together. And so I think we should take an example from a kindergarten class. You ever visit a kindergarten class? They see more of the similarities than they see the differences. My favorite example is of a little black boy and a little white boy on twin day, got the same haircut, and challenged their teacher to tell them apart. <laughs> the example of the kindergarten class is maybe the example that we should take. You can't resolve things through social media. I've never seen an argument on social media resolved. But I have seen when people sit down one-on-one -on -one and talk out their differences, that those are resolved. And how are the children? They're watching us. And we have an opportunity to tell them that we will not rest until all the children are well. And so it's with that that I am honored to take on this responsibility, this awesome responsibility given uh, by this board. And for the time I have, I will dedicate that to making sure all the children are well. And so um, as outlined in our, our board policy, BDD, if there are items that uh, need to come to me so that I can distribute those to our administration, I'll take those. If there are items that we have not created, I would ask that that would be a vote of the board so that we could prioritize that. But, uh, I stand as your employee, and I will work to make sure that our common vision uh, is met through our schools and our teachers. Our teachers need healing. Our children need healing. Our parents need healing. Our community does. There's only one thing that can bring us together, and that's focusing on what was, what is, and what will be most important, and that's the welfare of our children. So with that, Madam Chair, that concludes this portion of the superintendent's report, and I'll stand for questions before we move into reentry and ESSER update. Okay. Um, would anybody like to make any comments or questions based on that? Oh. Sorry, I didn't have it on. Anybody in the board like to comment on any of the, or have any questions for Dr. Ross? I have 
The board officers compiled a list of holdover items that we had um, questions from, from before, and I wanted to present those to you so that you could uh, operate on them. Of these questions, like from the public? No, those- From the board. Excuse me, those were holdover items from, from past board meetings okay. where we had been uh, given assurances that we would get answers. Get the answer, okay. It does, is everybody on the board, do y'all have a copy of that? Or do you need a copy? Everybody has a copy? Okay, good. Um, Dr. Ross, I uh, am excited about your speech. I, I, I think the message I got loudest and clear is how the children, <laughs> and that everything should be about the children. And I can tell you as a teacher myself in another district, you know, the COVID year has been hard anyway. And um, I think it is time for us to concentrate and set these goals and that strategic plan that's coming up and that we've talked about I'm, I'm really excited that your leadership will be there, and I'm expecting the board to be just as just as big a leader as Dr. Ross as we move forward. Um, I'm going to go to the re-entry and ESSER update unless there's any other question or statement to Dr. Ross. Okay? You got it. Thank you, Dr. Ross, Chairwoman Hammond, board members, and members of the public. The purpose of our brief presentation tonight is to provide an update on reentry in ESSER 3 next steps. Specifically, we want to share details of our plans to gather input from the district community on these two very important plans. As a recap, we presented a preliminary reentry plan for the 2021-22 school year at the June 14th school board meeting. We also shared that the preliminary return to in-person learning plan that we shared was part of a requirement of the American Rescue Plan for ESSER 3 funds. The due date for that plan was June 24th, and the district's around the state are required to review and, as appropriate, revise their safe return to in-person instruction class at least every six months for the next few years, in fact, 2024, uh, including seeking input and taking input into account. The second deadline we'd like to share is August 24th, and that is the date for submitting our ESSER 3 application and budget. So now we will outline the important public input portions of these two plans. As we mentioned at the June 14th meeting, we used public input from the months prior to influence the preliminary plan the board approved in June. Using the plan presentation feedback and revision method, the district plans to meet with several advisories later this week to include our parents advisories, faculty and staff advisories, and students. But we wanted to share that we will also gather input from the larger community, and that can be accomplished in several um, ways to include lunch and learn events and virtual town hall meetings, which we will announce publicly um, in the coming days. We will then use that feedback to revise our preliminary plan as needed and present it to the board for final approval. So again, we just wanted to share that we know the importance of community input and look forward to hearing our community's feedback regarding reentry in the coming days and weeks. In addition to reentry, we will be gathering feedback on ESSER 3 spending. This slide is similar to one we've shared at recent board members where we've outlined ESSER fund plans and talked about allowable uses for these federal funds. As a reminder, the goals of ESSER funds are to prevent, prepare, and respond to the impacts of COVID-19 and all expenditures must be allowable, reasonable, necessary, and meet federal requirements. We feel an important part of gathering feedback from the community on ESSER funds is also educating them about the allowable uses and the benefits that these funds can have on our district. So we will include um, information about ESSER and, and the presentations that we make. Finally, here are some key points of our ESSER 3 spending steps. Phase one is complete. We've submitted our preliminary return to in-person learning plan as required, and that is prominently displayed on our website. Over the next few weeks, we will seek feedback from the larger community, first educating the community uh, through presentations and our videos, and we'll gather input 
um, via surveys, advisory groups, or a combination of these different methods to influence the plan that we will eventually bring back to the school board in August. So as we've said for many, um, many of our presentations now, the district does value the input engagement of the community. We look forward to bringing plans to the board that include the input of our school and district leaders and take into account the valued feedback of our district community. And with that, Dr. Ross, I'll turn it back over to you for the next report. Um, Dr. Ross, if, I, if we have a question there, can we ask you on it now or you want to wait till you go over the next part? Right, that's up to you. Um, I was just going to ask, if you go back to the slide before that, I just made a note where it had summer learning. Um, is that making up for any learning loss, as we called it? Is that like a summer? Dr. Dr. G probably should answer that. I just was curious. I know we're in the middle of summer, so I wanted to see is that how we were catching kids up that were behind possibly from the COVID year. So we have multiple steps that were taken throughout this summer and then future plans as well for future summers using ESSER funds. Um, we have academic enrichment week, which is coming up next week for students identified in our tier three group. We also have for our tier two students, the Admentum program that they can utilize throughout the summer. And we also have a resource site for all of our students um, for tier one. So really, our plans throughout the summer serve a purpose for academic enrichment, but then also social emotional well-being and some of the mental health resources providing to students as well. So it's multi-steps beyond just academics as well. Yeah, because number nine had mental health supports. Um, and then th that was just advertised to parents and they could sign their children up for whatever the needs they saw. It depended on which category they were in. So based upon feedback and data that we received from the State Department of Education, um, they were identified to be in different tiers. So a tier one, a tier two, or a tier three. And based upon which tier they were in, families received information for their child based upon that, that tier. And was that tier chosen, was that decided by teachers? No, that was decided by data. So utilizing um, achievement scores and you. other data and other measures based upon um, standardized tests that students take. Good. I was just seeing how we identified them to be sure we reached every child that needed, needed the help. Thank you. Thank you. you have a question, Ms. Gardner? That's, this is just a follow-up um, question about the ESSER funds for summer learning. I guess I just need clarification because I, we ha have we received the ESSER three funds yet? I mean, because are we spending, so the, the current summer programs that we're doing right now, are those for ESSER three or is this gonna, are we gonna have money for next summer? The, the current summer programs are using ESSER two funds. Um, ESSER three will not be available to spend until we submit our budget by August the 24th. So these would benefit future summers. Any other question? Anybody? Ms. Huddle. I was curious, um, how does our enrollment for this summer um, for these programs compare to last year? It varies depending on school, quite honestly, and um, we also need to wait and see for the actual day for the academic enrichment week. We're going to monitor that data to see what attendance looks like. Um, depending on the school, you may get some cases where you have um, minimal students that are enrolled in other schools where more students are taking advantage of the opportunity. So it really, it really varies quite honestly from what we've seen. So I was, guess, I was just wondering, like, do we, you would think that there would be more children need it this year, right? So just as, are we seeing that? Or I know you can't like say specifically, but I was just kind of curious, is it about the same or seems more or less? I think it depends upon um, if the question is need versus the ability to participate, because some families have vacation plans or other plans that get in the way. As far as a need is concerned, the need is greater than it has been in the past. I wouldn't say it is double um, in size, but it's certainly more than it has been. More students have qualified for our summer reading camp, for example, than they have in the past. And that's probably the greatest um, comparison that we have is our summer reading camp, which has taken place for several years now. Mm -hmm. 
and that is for our third grade students based upon Read to Succeed. More students qualified this year than in the past, um, but it's not significantly more. And you actually touched on my last question, which was the barriers, and are, are you finding barriers that maybe with ESSER three for next summer, there's a way to help overcome some of those barriers for our parents? Potentially one of the barriers that we can foresee certainly is the length of the summer. It's a very short summer this year, so a lot of families and students included, they're quite honestly ready for a break. So we knew that our enrollment this year for our summer programs may be lower than it will be in future summers, simply because those summers will be back to a traditional length of time. I think that's been one of the greatest barriers. We have transportation available for our programs, so that barrier is taken away. Um, so I think really what it comes down to is this summer and, and, and the strains that this school year has had on families, not just the school year itself, but um, their families and the impact of COVID and everything else that they have dealt with, a lot of families need a break as well. So taking that time to really rest, relax, have time together, do other things, and then come back. So I do think our enrollment will increase in future summers. Thank you, Ms. Settle. Ms. Gardner. Well, in, in light of there being some burnout, do we have plans for the first two or three weeks of school to address all of those things, you know, to make sure that we're not just jumping in and trying to teach the next level? Are the teachers going to be given the ability to assess where all their students are? So yes, the answer to that question. Um, we have assessments that we do at the beginning of the school year so teachers can kind of assess to see over the summer if any progress was lost or where students may be at this time. And then certainly we, we try to use multiple data points, not just one data point, because oftentimes a student may have a bad day or may not be focused for that particular day. So you try to utilize as many data points as possible. But yes, to start the school year off, um, our board supported the use of ESSER II funds for two days for teachers to plan over the summer, so that was the support of everyone here, and we, which we appreciate, because our teachers can utilize data on their students for next year, this summer, as they plan and prepare. They also get a chance to utilize Instruction Hub from our State Department of Education, and that is another resource that our teachers can use to prepare for the school year. And then, of course, all the social-emotional um, supports that we're putting in place to make sure that our families and um, our students have the ability to come back to school prepared, focused, and ready to be successful. One more. Yeah. All right, one more question. As far as um, public input and feedback goes, um, I guess I'm trying to just be specific. Um, but just as a recap, you're going to try to educate and then we're going to send out a survey and ask people to email. Is that kind of how the feedback will work? That's correct. We feel it's important. The same dialogue that we're having with the board is what we feel we need with the public, giving them information, letting them ask us questions, and then sending out a survey for feedback regarding answer yes three. Okay, that's good. Thanks. Anybody else? All right. Then we thank you. For that and we'll do the number three monthly financial reports. Um, Ms. Rawls, thank you. Chairwoman Hammond, members of the board, Dr. Ross, um, you have before you the monthly revenue summary that one actually is the end of April, but we are at the end of May. So I think you should have the end of um, April information or end of May information in your board packet. And if you are looking at that information, you can see that as of May 31st, we are almost 94% of our revenue to date having been received. Since this time, um, we have, in fact, just today we got in the Lexington County tax receipts for the month of June and we're still due some information from Richland County. And we also um, have received all of our tier three funds. So we are in pretty decent shape, it would be over 100% of our revenue collected for the school year. Are there any questions on the revenue statement? Any questions? Anybody? Good. Ms. Rawls. 
and on the expenditure statement, you can see that I have never had this happen in my entire career, that we're at the exact same percentage to the hundredth digit. Um, th this is a once in a lifetime, I think, um, at 80.83% as of the same time last year. You know what? That's the sign of how good you are I and how know. glad we are we know. had that you. Was, that was, yeah. um, I recalculated that multiple times to make sure I had formulas right because I've never had that happen. But um, It's a sign, I promise. This, this would include the step increase that teachers received because they received that the middle of May. So that's a really good place to be in with all the extras that have been paid out with the bonus and with the, um, the, the step for the employees having been paid out and we're still at a, a good uh, rate of expenditure for the school year. Good. That sounds Any good. questions? Any questions, ladies and gentlemen? Ms. Rawls, that was exceptional. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Um, With that, that, that concludes the superintendent's report. Thank you.